We have been doing a series called uh, Encountering Jesus, and we uh, have been going through the book of Luke. I'm a, I'm a big fan of the book of Luke, and so we've been calling, kind of following where Jesus has been going, uh, because we feel like if we're going to live like Jesus, it's kind of good to kind of listen to how he lived. Uh, if we're going to uh, uh, be Christ followers, it's kind of good to uh, think about the person that we're, we're following. Uh, oftentimes we, we, we say that we're Christians and stuff, but our actions don't really match what our, what our words say. And so Jesus has been invited to a Pharisee's house. A Pharisee uh, at the time was a religious leader, someone that uh, was, uh, had within the uh, Hebrew uh, community authority, uh, someone that was feared by many people, uh, somebody that was, uh, in some cases, uh, clergy or sometimes people are uncomfortable with clergy, and they were like that with Pharisees because they, were, they had the authority. Uh, you, you look at me and you don't see that, I hope. But um, this guy named Simon invites Jesus to his place for dinner. And this is one of those things where it's not a confrontational type of situation. It's actually an invitation. You see, a lot of the Pharisees at this time are trying to trip Jesus up. They're trying to prove that he's not the authoritative person or the leader that everyone says he should be because they're kind of steal- he's kind of stealing the spotlight away from them. And the way that they would eat, at, and I've shown this before, but it's a good excuse to sit down, they would recline. And so they would be, they don't sit in chairs they would sit like, like this, and the dinner would be on a kind of a, a coffee table, and they would eat like this. The, the, uh, the message that they often gave was that as, as the Hebrew people, they had worked for so many years that when they ate, it was time to recline, and that was the practice that they did. Uh, they did have chairs at that time. A lot of people think that it, they were so prehistoric that they, they couldn't put two stools together. No, no, they had chairs, but when they ate... It was a time of sharing, a time of fellowship, and a time of relaxation. And so when Jesus ate, he took his place at the table, it says. And what that place would be, the place of honor would be a place at the end. And so his food would be here, and he is eating. The Mediterranean diet, I believe. And so... (laughs) I never thought... (laughs) Never thought that would get a laugh. I didn't... (laughs) <laughs> it's, I like it when people come here drunk. But, you know, <laughs> um, while he's sitting and talking with Simon and his friends, a woman comes in, and she's in a state. Uh, she is crying. She is, has tears, and she has an alabaster jar of ointment. Alabaster jars sometimes were used to uh, anoint people. They were filled with oils and herbs. Uh, sometimes they were used to anoint people in very holy ways, but other times they were used to actually anoint bodies that had been um, deceased. And they're very expensive. And she comes in, and she's crying, and she comes up to Jesus, and she doesn't even come up to him at his face. She stops at his feet. And she's sobbing. She's sobbing. And she takes the the ointment and she starts to rub Jesus' feet and clean his feet. And she's crying so much. I don't know if you've cried so much that your tears are just flowing. Well, her tears are flowing so much so that part of the things that she is cleaning Jesus' feet with are her own tears. And it says that she is wiping his feet with her hair. Sometimes we read these stories without pausing and trying to just kind of picture what that might have looked like. Imagine yourself, you're at this party, you're at this social gathering uh, with elite people, upper crust, and somebody comes in and starts doing this display. Well, obviously, it kind of made people pause, to say the least. And even Simon, the host, was caught off guard, and he thought to himself, if he, had only, if he only knew who this person was, 
Because you see, Simon knew this person. And he said, if, if he only knew who this person was, how sinful this person was, he wouldn't let her, he wouldn't let her even touch him. I don't even know what she's doing in my house. Have you ever had anybody in your life like that? Not somebody that's come and washed your feet, but somebody that you thought, they don't even deserve to be in the same space as other people. Some of us, we do have people in our lives that that we hold that much resentment towards or that we know that much about them that we don't feel like they really belong in a society of people. Definitely not a uh, upper crust kind of thing where they're talking uh, theology and they're talking, uh, you know, faith and things like that. And they've got this guy here and they're, they're wanting this intellectual conversation. They're wanting to talk facts. They're wanting to talk about uh, the afterlife and the kingdom of God and all of this kind of stuff and how it all kinds of, kind of comes in. And they want to know where he stands with the Pharisees. And in comes this sinful woman with tears in her eyes and starts to wash Jesus' feet. That's disruptive, disruptive, isn't it? Well, Jesus tends to know what people are thinking. So careful. <laughs> um, and he said, Simon... Have I ever told you about the lender? You see, there was this guy that lent money. And he lent uh, 500, I'll, I'll use dollars, $500 to one person. And to another person, he, he lent uh, 50 bucks. And then one day he comes up to them both and he says, I'm going to forgive your debt. You owe me nothing. And he said, Simon, who do you think is going to appreciate that more? And Simon said, well, intellectually, the person that, uh, that loaned him, that, that got the 500. He said, I, you know, when I came into this house, nobody offered to wash my feet. Nobody even gave me water to wash my feet, which was actually the custom of the time because feet were dirty. They wore sandals and it was the desert. Nobody even offered me any of that. And this woman's come in on her own. And since we have been sitting here talking, she has not stopped washing my feet with her tears and drying it with her hair. Those that are forgiven more often love more. Those that are forgiven less often love less. The interesting thing about this is that Jesus is in a situation where they are talking about faith. And the people that are in the room don't see what faith really is. Sometimes faith is, can be another word. The practice of faith can sometimes be called compassion. And compassion sometimes means forgiveness. Compassion sometimes means uh, allowing someone to be someone. Compassion sometimes means uh, not thinking that this person is a sinner, but rather thinking this person is a person. The lessons that Jesus teaches us, well, they're very motherly. motherly. Now, I don't want to put any pressure on moms here. Oftentimes on Mother's Day, we build them up like they're saints and they've never had a harsh word or they've never done anything. They are just, they are the epitome of roses. We could just do everything and be stupid and all that stuff and moms are going to come and forgive us. If anything, 
I hope that we walk out of here knowing that it's okay to be a person. Because Jesus was showing us what it's like to be motherly. And what we, Jesus does is something that we all strive to do. Some of us, we're not perfect at it. Some of us, even moms, dare I say, even moms are in the position of the Pharisee going, if, what is that person doing in my house? Who does that person think they are? This person just disrupted a normal, you know, dinner. I had the good china out, and now this person comes in with her feet thing? This is weird. Jesus is teaching us all to be motherly. Now, I hope that we use Mother's Day as a time to celebrate the people that are motherly in our lives. Sometimes that's not mom. Sometimes it's just the people that have shown us compassion when we needed it most. Sometimes that's people that uh, didn't put restrictions on us, but let us just be uh, humble in the moment of our need. And what Jesus is telling us is that each one of us is called to be motherly. Even us guys. Oftentimes we try to put uh, gender on things. Uh, the man is the protector. The woman is the nurturer. So on Mother's Day, we're supposed to talk all about nurturing. On Father's Day, we're supposed to talk about protecting. I think on both of those days, those subjects that we talk about, whether it's nurturing or protection, should inspire all of us, all of us to be like that. Just because I'm a father, does that mean that I can't show compassion to my son? Gosh, I hope not. The things that I've learned from my mom, I hope that I have personally passed that on to my son. And I hope that we all can. I hope that we can take this moment to look at this situation here because what was happening was that the woman that came in, did she hesitate before she came in the door? It was obviously pre-planned. She brought the jar with her. Did she think, I better not do this? Did she, did she pace outside every once in a while and think, oh, this is going to be embarrassing? Or did she just allow her emotions to show? And did she, did she just say, to heck with whatever people think of me, this is the task I have at hand, is to love Jesus with all my heart, so much so that I will wash his feet with all my tears. And did Jesus say, hey, you go out and settle your sins first, and then you might come in and talk to me. Or did Jesus just meet her where she was at the moment that she was and just say, bless you? Whether we have kids or not, uh, whether our mothers are here or not, whether we've had good mothers, bad mothers, I pray that we all try to be a little motherly today, which means compassionate, welcoming, understanding, and forgiving. I pray that we can all do that today.